Bell ended up having to pay Maloney, even though Bell won. Can you believe it? Look at this number. This is a community supported legal education channel. Find out how you can support our mission at the links in the description below. This was provided this week by the Overhauser Law Offices, who I'm assuming may be involved in this somehow. And this is Richard Bell and versus Michael Maloney's entry on plaintiff's motion for attorney's fees and costs and defendant's cross motion to enforce a Rule 68 offer, which we just talked about in, what was it, Wednesday's video with Richard Leibowitz. And this is, this is kind of tongue in cheek. This is some schadenfreude, if you like some law schadenfreude. And then we're gonna get to an actual copyright part of this. How in the world are statutory damages gonna be $200? So let's have some law schadenfreude fun and let's talk about $200 statutory damages, how the heck that happens. On June 11th, the court entered judgment in favor of Richard Bell in this copyright infringement action, found Bell was entitled to $200 in statutory damages and the cost of this action. Bell now seeks his attorney's fees of $33,500 for a $200 win and a court costs of $4,720. Maloney cross moves for leave to file a bill of costs totaling $2,183 and to enforce his Rule 68 offer, a Rule 68 offer of judgment. The court finds for the reasons explained below that the offer of judgment should be enforced and that Maloney is entitled to the costs he incurred after the offer was rejected. Remember I said this was a fee shifting provision. Now you get to see how it works and you get to see someone lose kind of big time. Cause what did I just say? That was $33,000 that the plaintiff thought they were due and now it flips. It's gonna flip. On May 10th, 2016, prior to filing this action, Bell sent Maloney a demand for $5,000. The demand letter was couched as a settlement offer for Maloney's copyright infringement of a photograph of the Indianapolis skyline by Bell. Maloney did not accept the offer. On May 12th, 2016, Bell filed a complaint for copyright infringement against Maloney in this court, Indiana court. Maloney filed his answer following a grant of an extension of time, etc. August 15th, Maloney sent Bell an offer of judgment pursuant to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 68. The offer allows Bell to take judgment against Maloney. So Maloney loses in a simple lump sum payment for $2,500. It's like an on the record settlement. And it says, quote, for all claims for relief, and expressly includes all attorney's fees and costs. Future lawyers and even existing lawyers, that's important. Make sure you read up on your Rule 68 offers of judgment and how you have to phrase the all claims for relief and all attorney's fees and costs. If you get that wrong, you could lose big time. So be careful with this. This is actually really important. Following Bell's rejection of the offer, the parties engaged in discovery. The case went forward and filed cross motions for summary judgment. July 18th, 2017, the court denied the party's cross motions, finding issues of material fact that needed to be resolved at trial. After a one-day bench trial, July 24, 2018, the court found Bell was the prevailing party and awarded him $200 in statutory damages. Keep in mind the minimum statutory damages in the law are $750 minimum statutory damages. So how in the world do we get to two? They're not gonna tell us here. We have to go back to the other case. We'll get there. His request for an injunction was denied. On June 24th, 2019, Bell filed his motion for fees and costs. And don't even ask me how that happens. That was a year. That was the better part of a year. 11 months between the bench trial and the, or the, the finding at least, and the motion for fees and costs. I didn't know you were allowed to take a year to do that. I thought it had to be in with like 30 days or something, but I've actually never filed one. I've always been able to settle them. If uh, at one time, I think we ever got to the part where I was going to make a motion for fees and costs, the opposing party just worked with us and um, we gave them a slight discount because they made some good points and, and thought that we, they weren't going to owe us everything. And we agreed and their, their, their agreement was reasonable and we took it. And, and so we didn't have to do that. Uh, they, they obviously couldn't do that here. A prevailing party is normally entitled to costs pursuant to federal rule of civil procedure 54 D. 
that rule is qualified by Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 68. Rule 68 is designed to provide a disincentive for plaintiffs from continuing to litigate a case after being presented with a reasonable offer. The part of Rule 68 at issue is the cost-shifting provision affecting a plaintiff who rejects a good-faith offer which is more favorable than the future judgment obtained. Quote, if the judgment that the offeree, which would be what the recipient the plaintiff if the judgment that the offeree finally obtains is not more favorable than the unaccepted offer the offeree must pay the costs incurred after the offer was made so follow me here where the underlying statute defines costs to include attorney's fees such fees are to be included the statute under which bell seeks attorney's fees is such a statute so 17 usc 505 shifts the attorney's fees award the court may also award a reasonable attorney's fee to the prevailing party as part of the costs bell's rejection of maloney's offer of judgment requires the court to determine whether the judgment finally obtained was less favorable than his $2,500 offer, inclusive of costs and attorney's fees. The judgment finally obtained includes the damages the court awarded Bell and the attorney's fees and costs that accrued before the offer was made. Bell's attorney's fees incurred prior to the offer date. It was because the offer was made right away. Remember, it was made right away. This is important to do right away or you have to account for the attorney's fee they were made right away on october 15th 2016 and the attorney's fees were for 1.6 hours of work 225 dollars an hour a total of 360 dollars the costs incurred are the filing fee and service fees, $400 and $1,750 respectfully. The transcript fees are $1,440.78. The copying costs are $670 and other costs are $2,192. And those came after the offer and those are not allowed. Therefore, the judgment finally obtained equals the sum of $400 plus $1,750 plus $360 plus plus the $200 damage award, a total of, drum roll please, $977.50, far less than Maloney's $2,500 offer. So you see how that works? Thus, pursuant to the plain language of Rule 68D, Maloney as the offeree is entitled to the costs he incurred after the offer date. Maloney filed a bill of costs on the same day he cross-filed his motion for enforcing the Rule 68 offer and leave for filing bill of costs. Because Maloney is entitled to his post-offer costs, the court will accept the filing and determine whether the costs he seeks are allowed under Rule 54D and the applicable law. Maloney's bill of costs seeks 1484.30 for transcript fees, 147.24 for for witness fees, $527.23 for copying costs, $25 for parking on the day of trial. His costs, therefore, are $2,183.77, are reasonable and appropriate under federal law, and Maloney is entitled to these costs. In conclusion, Bell took a risk when he rejected Maloney's offer of judgment and lost. He must now bear the consequences of his decision and pay Maloney his post offer costs. Accordingly, the court denies the motion for attorney's fees and grants the motion for the Rule 68 offer of judgment. The total, having reviewed Maloney's previously filed bill of costs, is that Bell is taxed at $1,206.27. So Bell ended up having to pay Maloney, even though Bell won. Can you believe it? Look at this number. <laughs> We are going to go over to the Richard Bell v. Maloney findings and facts of conclusions of law. And there's a lot of background here, and I could take a lot of time, but I don't know that the background is really that uh, essential. Basically, Richard Bell is an attorney. He takes pictures. He hired a expensive website developer 
which I believe is related to West Law, and uh, put photos that were important to him and that he took time to edit um, onto his website. And then I think Maloney used it. Defendant Michael Maloney is a retired career federal law enforcement officer. He is presently semi-retired, living in Kansas City. During his years of service, Maloney gained a level of expertise through education and experience in forensic investigations and has published two books. So you can probably go read his books on forensic investigation. Sounds actually kind of fun. I might, I might do that. Maloney currently provides occasional consultation, training, seminars, written books. He is the owner and operator of a website called MaloneyForensics.com. This website was developed and conceptualized by his wife, in early 2014, Maloney scheduled a forensic seminar, etc. He marketed the seminar through his website. His wife assisted him. She has a background in computer programming, but she is not trained or experienced in web design. She chose the basic color schemes and photographs and stated that Apple abandoned the iWeb platform, so she provided design to a different host, Hostinista. Maloney and Maxine located a photographic image of the city of Indianapolis that could be used in marketing his event. He instructed her to use only non-copyrighted images that were free to the public. She conducted an extensive search of the internet that resulted in obtaining plaintiff's photo. She began her search using the terms free photos of Indianapolis. While the Indianapolis photo did not appear on the first page, it appeared on the second. It said more images for free photos of Indianapolis. She eventually clicked on this photo. This is the photo. It says image may be subject to copyright. She did see that warning, but there was no identification or copyright information associated with the picture as an embedded watermark or copyright symbol. She went to two source pages designated under the photograph, neither of which contained any information about copyright. After visiting the two source pages, she downloaded the photo and uh, checked the metadata. That's, that's, oh wow, how many of you would have checked the metadata? Let us know in the comments below. No metadata was attached to the photograph, so it attached the date it was downloaded. This is not the first time Maxine has checked to see if a photograph on the internet was subject to copyright protection. She has performed such checks before. So she believed she had exercised due diligence and that the photo did not have any license or, or need, need to be licensed or would be violating any copyright laws. So Bell then discovers the infringement and the judge continues. We are going to skip a little bit to the part of the Copyright Act that I think is relevant here. Uh, because these are works made for hire and etc. This is all not really important to whether or, or to how she got the $200 judgment. So Bell elects statutory damages and tries to get $10,000. However, 17 U.S.C. 504 C2 grants the court the power in certain instances to make a reduced award of $200. Quote, in a case where the infringer sustains the burden of proving and the court finds that such an infringer was not aware and had no reason to believe that his or her acts constituted an infringement of copyright, the court in its discretion discretion may reduce the award of statutory damages to a sum of not less than $200. So you have heard me crow about statutory damages for years, and this is the one time that I have ever, ever, ever seen this $200 innocent infringement thing work this way. Let me show you just a little bit of what the chapter looks like. Uh, 504 allows statutory damages of not less than $750 or, or not more than $30,000 except for infringement committed willfully, which can be up to $150 thousand dollars per infringement and then immediately after that comes the sentence that the court quoted there maxine on behalf of maloney downloaded it tried to find non-infringing photos did not realize this was an infringing photo so that's why the award was only two hundred dollars and costs 
So we learned a lot on that one, didn't we? We learned about Rule 68 offers. We got to see a plaintiff win a case, but lose the money. I don't even know how, I mean, I know how, but like, boom, like, how could you like do that? How could you, how could you do that to your client? Like you had $2,500 coming and instead now you owe 1200. So how strange of a result is that? What kind of schadenfreude is that? Did you enjoy that case? I, uh, I thought you would enjoy that case. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching. I am Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. That is our show. Thank you to our sponsors in the month of October. Remember, this is a show that was produced at the end of October, or October 31st, so that there will be a slight rollover. Supporters who support in November will get charged on November 1st and will also roll over into the very first or day, one or two days of December. So thank you to our October sponsor, channel sponsor, Joshua Davis from Tandapay. Thank you very much for for all of your support. Thank you to our October $50 plus supporters, Joe Tyson, Aspernari, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Evie, Kyle Mudrock, Michael Pierce, Spirit Bear, Jan Negre, Daniel Perez, Snorri Wazatsky, Black Leaf, and Benjamin Hightoff. And thank you to the $5 plus supporters who are scrolling on the screen in front of me and all of you are on the LED panel behind me. I'm Leonard French, your favorite copyright attorney. I look forward to seeing you in the videos that drop. I will see you on Sunday for the 10 a.m. show at the US time. I love you all. Bye. Someone play ball with the dog, please. Someone please play ball with the dog. Okay, hang on. Let me get a throw. Alright, we got a dog ball thrower. And here is a dog ball. And here are the dogs. In their new fenced in area. So this is where they stay when I am in Luxembourg with Kaylee or when my parents just want them for an evening because dog friends are great friends. Nico, no. All right, you can't have both. <laughs>